Good day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Lilly with the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome, welcome you to today's webinar entitled Moving Green, Opportunities and Challenges for China's Recovery Plan. We are grateful to Dr. Lin Zheng from the University of Hong Kong for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization provides two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our presenter. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have questions for Dr. Zhang, please press the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window and type your question. We have allocated sufficient time at the end of the webinar to read and answer them. And now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Lin Zhang. Assistant Professor at the School of Energy and Environment at the City University of Hong Kong. Dr. Zheng, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, sharing some of my uh, research findings regarding uh, the COVID-19 and its impact in China to all of you. So uh, first of all, let me share my uh, screen. Good. Thanks, thanks for uh, joining today's webinar. I know uh, it's quite late uh, for people from Asia, so I will keep my presentation as short as possible so you can go to sleep earlier. So as you can see, the presentation of today is on uh, moving green the opportunities and challenges for China's recovery plan. So uh, in the beginning, I will give a very uh, brief introduction or overview of the current situation of COVID-19 at the global level and also in China. And then the talk will be divided, being divided into two parts. The first part will focus on the COVID-19 in China and the associated quarantine policy and to what extent the COVID-19 and policy affects its environment and economy. In the second part, I will discuss the economy recovery plan in China mainly focus on the opportunity and challenges. So uh, this figure was provided by Professor Ri Jian, the Vice President of City University of Hong Kong. Uh, in this figure, it shows the uh, predictions on the uh, increased cases in different countries in the world regarding the COVID-19. And the blue and dark areas in, in this figure shows there's a, a more than 5% of the increase of the uh, cases. And you can see that's uh, in uh, Indian and in other uh, South, uh, uh, South American countries, that's a significant increase of uh, COVID-19. And, the, oh, sorry. And if you look at the increased confirmed cases outside of China and China, there's a that present a different situations. For China, the newly confirmed cases actually goes to a, a very small numbers, but in the uh, outside of China, the confirmed cases actually increasing uh, every day, in particular uh, since uh, April and May, there's a significant increase because of the uh, a second wave of the outbreak in, in the US and in India. And so far, we find, we see that's a, that the total number of confirmed cases outside of China is already exceed uh, 13, uh, 13 million. So that's quite uh, huge numbers. So we would like to see why the situations in China and outside of China are different. If you look back, we can see the involvement of COVID-19 in China. Actually, uh, since the reported case in Wuhan, and uh, very quickly, the government started to uh, to lock down the whole city in 23rd of January. And the city Wuhan is locked down and the travel from nearby cities are restricted. And then later from uh, February 3rd, 
the Hong Kong also closed uh, its borders to, to uh, mainland China. And in 7th of February, all students are asked not to go back to, uh, to school after the Chinese New Year. And you can see in February, there's a significant increase of the in confirmed cases. And uh, because of the lockdown, the lockdown of the city and lockdown of the whole country, for mostly for the quarantine policies. And then we will see, and after one month, the increased cases actually reduced quite a lot and this uh, total number is almost flat. And because of the, uh, because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 in other countries, then in uh, 28th of March, uh, China suspended the uh, entry to most of the foreign countries. And so far, we still see uh, quite a uh, small numbers of increased cases these days in China. So that is the uh, general uh, ideas of the, uh, and also the revolution of the, the COVID-19 in, in China. Okay, let's go move to the first part of the uh, talk, the lockdown policy and its impact. Definitely because of the lockdown policy uh, in China and also in other countries, and a lot of uh, activities are cannot continue, right? So the, the stop of these activities actually have a big impact uh, on the air pollutants and the greenhouse gases. We can see that some, for those uh, major pollutant, uh, NO2, PM2.5, PM10, and CO2 emissions, there's a significant decline as the worldwide levels. It is estimated by the WMO that the uh, carbon emissions will fall by 6% in 2020 in this year just only because of the COVID-19 uh, health crisis. This is the largest drop in a single year since the Second World War. And in China, if you just look at Wuhan, Wuhan, because Wuhan is the uh, city who, uh, which reported the first case of uh, COVID-19. So in Wuhan, the, the three figures in the other panel shows the uh, NO2 emissions in February, January in 2019, one year ago. And the three figures in the bottom panel shows the uh, NO2 emissions in, in January and February, the same month in Wuhan this year. You can see the significant decline of this uh, NO2 emissions if you compare these two years is for the same month. Right? And also for the whole country, you can see that uh, the, uh, the left panel shows the NO2 emissions in China in January, and the uh, right panel shows the NO2 emissions uh, in February. Because in January, the reported cases only in Wuhan, then it started to spread to other parts of China. And so that's, uh, in January, there's still, in other part of China, there's still a significant uh, level of NO2 emissions. But in February, because of the quarantine policy lockdown, then there's a significant decline of the NO2 emissions for the whole country. Uh, there's a very clear difference. All these data sources are, are pictures are from uh, NASA. And we can also look at the different indicators for the industrial activities. We can see there's a, a Qingdao coal port uh, throughput and also the steel plant the refinery utilization and the national blood fillers. They said also, you can see all these uh, industrial activities has a significant decline in, in, in 2020. And during the four weeks since the uh, 3rd of February this year, the daily reported power plants average coal consumption dropped to the lowest in four years. If you look further to Detail to the detailed coal consumption of six major power firms. We can see that uh, before the Chinese New Year, so this slide is before the Chinese New Year, we can see a significant decline uh, for all the years, right? Uh, from 2014 to 2020, all this year, because uh, during the Chinese New Year, everybody goes going to get together with family to enjoy the holidays. That is reasonable. It's follow the same trend. But after the Chinese New Year, because of the outbreak of the COVID-19 across the whole country, we can see for other years, the, there's a rebound of this uh, coal use consumption, right? But for, for this year, because of the lockdown, the, the coal consumption is still at a quite low level compared to other years. 
Of course, after two months, after two months, after six, 60 days, the level of uh, co-consumption is uh, approaching the normal level. So we can also do a very simple uh, estimation to show the environmental impact. So for example, to calculate the uh, CO2 emission associated with coal consumption, uh, we can do a simple calculation to compare the coal consumption for power generations between 2019 and 2020. Uh, for example, we, we can see the 30 days after the Chinese New Year, because after the Chinese New Year actually is the, is the real start of this uh, outbreak of the, the COVID-19, right? So we can divide the 30 days into four segments and compare the coal consumption for each of these uh, segments. We can see that's a significant decline of the coal consumption, right? With the, with the spread of the, of the diseases, then the, the, de the reduction of the coal consumption is uh, even further, right? Of course, you can do a more detailed analysis to compare every day, but this is just the illustration. We can do a similar things for, for oil, for, for natural gas, right? Then we can uh, sum up to calculate the total uh, emission uh, reduction. This is about uh, 184 million tons of CO2 emissions. And this is only for the, for the energy sectors. If you add up uh, this uh, re reduced emissions in other industries, this number is, will be much higher, right? And we know that in, uh, in 2019, uh, the carbon intensity in China is about uh, one ton of CO2 emissions for 10,000 yuan of GDP. So if we assume that carbon intensity in 2019 is the same as in 2020, the same, the just two years are the same, then we can do a simple estimation to know uh, how much economic loss is associated with, is associated with this uh, total emission reduction, right? Uh, the calculation says, shows that the uh, economic loss is 1.7 trillion yuan. Okay. So only in one month of lockdown, the economic low loss is about 1.7 trillion. So this number is about is over 10% of Italy's GDP in 2019. So you can see that's why for most uh, European countries, they are quite reluctant to, to implement this uh, quarantine, this uh, lockdown policy in the beginning, because they know the economic loss is huge. Of course, uh, this lockdown policy results uh, in the reduction in pol uh, environmental pollutants, in particular for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But this kind of positive environmental impact is temporary. Why? Because if you look at further for those uh, industrial activity indicators, after, after two months, so after two months, actually, all these uh, in the industrial activity uh, indicators are moved to the normal levels compared to the previous years, okay, to the normal levels. Of course, it's still, it's still a little bit lower than previous years because uh, in certain part of China still, uh, they are implementing a quite restrictive uh, policy to control the diseases. Besides, so we have this uh, kind of uh, temporary positive environmental impact. But we also have some uh, environmental challenges in the long run. And uh, in the very beginning, the government uh, suggested, suggested all the people in China to wear a mask in the beginning. So that is why, so every time you go out, you have to wear a mask. That if every day one people using one mask, that's a quite a lot of waste, right? So the increased medical waste will be a big problem if like, they are not very well recycled. And because the material used to, uh, to produce this uh, mask are also not easy, not, uh, not uh, environmental friendly. So we know that uh, actually Hong Kong developed, the Hong Kong government developed kind of a uh, recyclable, recyclable mask to be used. Uh, I don't know the real situation of the, of the usage of this kind of recycle, uh, recycle mask. But we, we can see from this uh, picture shows that uh, uh, if we cannot uh, properly to deal with this uh, waste, medical waste, that will be a big challenge in the long term. And the second environmental challenge is because the rise of the nationalism, right? The rising nationalist uh, sentiment and the related trading hostility in some countries, in particular 
in some uh, regions of, of China, uh, outside of China, they made it impossible to rely on the uh, predictable supply and price of imported fuel and materials. And this may affect the energy consumption choice of, of relevant countries. And because of the rising of this uh, nationalist, nationalist uh, sentiment, this kind of uh, sentiments are very uh, digital for, for international cooperation. Uh, I see uh, some people are asking questions. Probably I will take all the questions after, uh, after my presentation. And we should also be a lot of this uh, health risk, uh, health, health risks brought by the climate change. Because we know the current temporal reduction in carbon emissions is not a structural change in uh, energy consumption. So any positive environmental impact must be reflected in our changing uh, production consumption habits to make it uh, cleaner or more environmental friendly. Because only the long-term systematic change will change the trajectory of carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. Right. So that is saying uh, for the government, if they are uh, planning some economic stimulus plans to help the individuals or business for possible recessions, they must to find a, uh, find a way to provide a sustainable path for a cleaner future. And for the macroeconomy, uh, there's some scenarios to predict the, the GDP growth for, for China, for different regions and for the world. And you see that uh, uh, for China, because uh, China uh, responds to quickly, the first two response to the diseases and to shut down, uh, to turn down uh, the country, lock down the country. So the GDP go, goes down quickly in the first quarter of this year. And for other countries, they act later, so there's a, a delayed effect for other countries. Actually, for the first quarter of China, the GDP, the, GDP, the, the growth of GDP, the real growth of GDP is the negative 6.8%. So in previous years, we can experience, experience positive more than 6% of the, of the GDP, but this year, the first quarter is a negative. And the most decline is because of the the secondary, the industrial sectors, because uh, the lockdown policy makes it uh, difficult for firms to uh, operate. And uh, in China, the export account for around 20% of the total GDP. So because of the uh, lockdown policy in other countries will definitely affect the uh, export of China. Right? So in US, it's account for 30, 17% of the total export for EU, another 17% and for other countries. So the lockdown policy in other countries will definitely affect the uh, export uh, in China. And also if you look at the uh, uh, purchasing managers index, PMI, which is the index to show the economic conditions in the manufacturing and service sectors. So solely for the manufacturing, we can see that's in the uh, in the first month, in the second month, uh, second month of February of 2020, there's a significant decline of this uh, PMI index. This also shows that the uh, lockdown policy actually heavily hits the uh, manufacturing industry. So that's a bad things. Then we also have some good things, right? This is because of the lockdown policy and because of the out outbreak of the diseases actually people try to avoid try to avoid the face to face contact so if you look at this figure this figure shows the uh, weekly downloads of the car sharing apps so this is for for the data for U uh, uber in us and this is for uh, blah blah car in france and this for dd in china you can see there's a significant decline of this uh, uh, car sharing apps downloading so this is because the, the demand of using these car sharing services declines. People try to avoid to, to use these uh, outside activities, uh, services. And at the same time, we see a significant increase of the online service apps, the, the online uh, educational apps, the uh, online business apps, and other social media apps. And we also see that AI and 5G technology has been adopted by uh, many cities and provinces in China. 
uh, in order to reduce the uh, risk of infection. So, so China actually incorporated these drones into its response to COVID-19. Uh, COVID, COVID drones are adapted to, for example, to uh, spray uh, disinfecting chemicals in some uh, public spaces and on some, uh, some areas, impacted areas, uh, to prevent the vehicle traveling. And this can also be used to deliver medical samples to reduce unnecessary human contacts, or also uh, deliver consumer items to people who are being uh, uh, quarantined, who, are able, who, are, who don't, don't have access to food or other goods. And these are uh, screenshots that I got from my uh, mobile phone. So sorry for the Chinese. And this is then a screenshot of this uh, Alipay. Uh, and these are screenshots of the WeChat. And these two services, these two apps actually provide the services to uh, provide information, timely official information, tell you how many uh, confirmed cases, how many accumulated cases, how many uh, deaths, how many acute cases in different regions, in different cities in China, uh, and also uh, numbers also reported for, for other countries as well. So this, by using these uh, this, uh, uh, mobile services, these are uh, work very well connected to the inspection platform of the, of the state council. So they are able to provide the official information to the public, so provide a, a public channel uh, on any local information on this uh, pandemics. So that this really helps a lot for people to know that the local information to avoid to to go to some certain places where uh, the spread of the diseases is, is severe. And we see also this uh, robot is used for restaurant to deal to, to deliver food, and this uh, used for 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 hospitals to deliver the medical medicines to de deliver the medical uh, items to to avoid any uh, unnecessary contact. So it is very likely that this current crisis actually is activating a new wave of development of, of AI technology. So this will probably accelerate the structural change of the economy, and that could, could help to lower the greenhouse gas emissions right, to some extent. And this will accelerate the development of this uh, the so-called sustainable smart cities and uh, medical innovation to, to promote the transformation of the economic structure. Because this is the uh, demand driven, uh, demand driven to create a smart life which combines the uh, complex high technologies, right? more frequently to use the online platforms. So the government could also to have to develop a, develop a public health infrastructure that could integrate these new technologies and innovations. And this will, will be able to integrate the big data solutions into the public health system. That will finally, finally to reduce the potential, uh, potential uh, diseases in the future. So for, for at the sectoral level, for energy sector, so for the coal sector, the delay of this resumption of the production for the coal, for coal industries and for the downstream, uh, downstream firms in the coal industry, of course, will have certain uh, impact, but this impact will be uh, short term. In the long term, the coal industry may be affected by the, the regulation, by the policies. Okay, the policy, the central, the central government policy to reduce the use of coal to, reduce, to increase the use of renewable energies, for example. And also for, for power sectors, the commercial and industrial uh, electricity demand have dropped sharply because of lockdown policy in the short run. But from a regional perspective, the growth rate of electricity consumption in the central and in the, in the eastern part of the, of the country because of the epidemic, there's a, a sharply decline. But in the western region, uh, which is uh, less affected by the, by the COVID-19, then it continues to increase its contribution to electricity and consumption, the total electricity consumption of our country. For the petroleum industry, from the supply side, the oil company have to increase the inventory because the demand for the because the demand declines, then the supply have to 
to be stayed in the inventory, right? The demand side, the resident travel demand drops, so the use of uh, petroleum declines, and this also affected by the delayed resumption policy. For example, for those uh, large-scale outdoor engineering, this for those uh, industry mining mining firms, and for logistic transportation because of their uh, lockdown, and uh, and also because of the gradual resumption of this uh, production in this in these sectors is uh, in the short run there will be a decline. For renewable for renewable energies, uh, again in the short run in the short run there will be some impact, but from a perspective for uh, for a year, if you look at this in a year in a yearly base, in a yearly base we will see uh, that's the, the overall impact will be uh, limited uh, for solar energy, for wind power energy. Uh, but of course, there's, a, there's another view saying that's because of the COVID-19, right, that the COVID-19 will uh, disrupt the investment and the supply chain and also disrupt the, the technology diffusions. Then the COVID-19 may have a, a negative impact on the renewable because the renewable energies, they, it requires a lot of investment and requires a lot of uh, advanced uh, technology innovation and development. So therefore, uh, in order to uh, enable new low carbon energy choice to be available later, the international flows of low carbon technology and policies must, must be uh, quickly re reimagined. Otherwise, there will be a, neg a strong negative impact for the renewable energy. That's, this is a, another view. Uh, regarding the renewable energy. That's the firm level. So if you look at the uh, uh, consumer user index, we see that uh, for the positive ones, it's only for those uh, online service, service provider firms, so they have a significantly uh, positive uh, impact. For those uh, offline activities, there's a negative index showing that uh, they are strongly affected by by the, by the COVID-19, by the disease. And uh, uh, if you look at the uh, operating income for different countries, so uh, more than 80%, uh, more than 90% of the firms, they report they have a decline in the operating income with more than half showing that there is a significant decline in the operating income. The effect is strong. And for that reason, obvious, so, so green manufacturing, which we uh, think is more important for sustainability uh, previously, is no longer the main concern of the firm. Because now the main concern of the firm is to survive, right? The survive. The most important problem for them is to solve the sales problem for the, to reduce the potential cost and to re, how to resume the, uh, the logist, uh, logistics. So that's the, that's the main issue they are, they are having to consider now instead of the, the green manufacturing aspects. Okay, so uh, I briefly show you the COVID-19, the quarantine policy in China and how this uh, policy uh, impact the environment uh, of China, how this impact the macro economy uh, at the national levels and the sectoral levels and firm levels. Now, since, uh, since now the, this uh, COVID-19 is uh, well controlled in, in China, the government decided to, to think about how to uh, recover its economy affected by, by, the, this, by this uh, health crisis. So first of all, we would like to understand why do we need a green uh, recovery plan? So uh, actually, actually the, the climate change the climate change will lead to an increase of disease. Of course, uh, besides the climate change, so this time this COVID-19 is because of the illegal, uh, it is reported that time, it's not, uh, it's not concluded, but there's a suspicion that the illegal trade of this uh, wildlife could be, could be the reason for the, the start of this uh, COVID-19, right? And also deforestation, intensified agricultural uh, livestock production, this will also have impact uh, on the diseases, future diseases, and climate change is one of these reasons. 
And uh, it is possible because the, uh, if we don't do a green uh, economy, then the air pollution, the environmental pollution, these uh, airborne particulate matters could exacerbate the COVID-19. There's uh, no consensus on this, but there's a study uh, on the SARS 2003. So in, in 2003, we also have another kind of disease, SARS, right? There's a, there's a report showing that uh, for regions with a uh, high pollution, people, the mortality rate of the people in those, uh, in those regions, they are dying with a higher probability of 84% compared to regions with low pollution. So it is possible for this, for, for the COVID-19 day, this uh, pollution, pollutant may also have some impact. Right. So in general, we know this, uh, this COVID-19 disease and climate change, they, they are all public health emergency. So for COVID-19, it's more acute. It spread rapidly through the community around the world. And the climate change is more like a chronic public health emergency, which is exacerbated by health crisis associated with extreme weather, wildlife. They are both, they are both sourced from the environment. They are also harm to the human health, right? If not well, uh, act, well, not well uh, prepared, then both scenario will result in a lot of loss of death of the, of the, of the people. And also the climate change will, will reinforce the potential uh, diseases in the future. Of course, there's a, quite a lot of evidence showing that the historical diseases, the wars uh, have a, some association with the climate change with, associated with the greenhouse gases. So throughout the human history, we can see that actually the spread of these diseases has been associated with the change in carbon emissions, even before the industrial uh, uh, age. So for example, if you look at uh, these figures, so if you look at this uh, uh, upper right, uh, this figure shows that actually for this period, this period is the 12th century to the 14th century, the Mongol uh, evasion. So there's a decline, significant decline of this uh, uh, CO2 emissions. And for, for this period, this period is during the 16th, 16th century uh, when the Ming Dynasty falls, they also decline. And for Europe, we see uh, during, the, during the 1347 and uh, 14th century, because of the black dust, uh, we can see a significant decline of these uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Also uh, for the Americans, because of the colonial destruction of the Americans in the 15th century and the 17th century, the carbon emissions also declines. And more recently for this uh, financial crisis in 2008, we also see a significant decline of the, of the global uh, financial crisis. However, this uh, uh, emission falls uh, during the financial crisis because of the, the political reasons or because of the economic recessions. It's not uh, because of the structural change in the energy consumption. So, so one or two years later, there's a significant rebound, rebound of this, uh, uh, CO2 emissions. So all this evidence shows that the, this kind of different events, historical events, uh, no matter it's the war or diseases or financial thing, they have a big impact on the, on the emissions, on the climate change. And also we know the climate change will affect the uh, diseases. So to, in order to, to overcome these environmental challenges, the government to have to provide an, an open, transparent information to the public to build a strong public health system and will require uh, global cooperation, of course, as well. And uh, we also need to develop uh, 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 advanced technology in order to uh, curb the climate change and in order to, to deal with the diseases. Okay, so for understand, we understand now uh, why we need a green, uh, green uh, plan to recover our economy. And now, actually based on the government report of China 2020, uh, I would like to here to uh, highlight several points. Uh, that's the China's recovery plan. 
that could they the government used to to recover the this economy. So the government uh, focuses on the quality development. So in previous years, usually in the government work report, the the central government will define a targeted growth rate for the next year. But this time, this is the first time in this report that the government does not set a GDP growth target this year. This does not mean that it's, uh, it has uh, touched less important to economic growth. Actually, it instead shows that government is paying great attention to the high quality development. And the second point I would like to highlight is the proactive physical policy. They, they adopt a more proactive physical policy to by expand, for example, by expanding the, the central government budget deficit uh, to increase the fund transfer to local government in order to boost the investment and to maintain the stable uh, economic development. So for, for, for expanding the physical budget deficit, is will expand to uh, 3.76 trillion yen, which is about uh, 530 billion US dollars. So we also uh, call this a four trillion plan. So I will talk this later. And the third point is about the uh, to by expanding the effective investment mainly on the, the so-called new infrastructure projects. Okay. And that the, the fourth point I would like to mention is that the, the government plan to promote the recovery of consumption uh, by improving the consumption willingness or capability of, of the residents. So, for example, uh, uh, for the provinces, uh, for the city, the Shenzhen city, uh, the government provides, for example, the, the consumption coupon in order to, to, to improve the consumption willingness uh, for, the, for the consumers. Okay, now uh, in the following, I will focus on this four trillion plan and the new uh, infrastructure pro uh, projects. So the first, the new infrastructure projects, uh, as uh, clarified by the National Development Reform Commission, uh, this, that, that this new type of infrastructure actually is guided by new development concept driven by the technological innovation uh, based on information network oriented to high quality development. Then it's classified. This uh, this uh, new type of infrastructure into uh, three types, three classes. The information infrastructure mainly based on the evolution of new generation of information techn technology, for example, the AI technology, the 5G technology. And the second class is about the uh, integrated infrastructure by integrate, by deep integration of different infrastructures to construct, construct for example, a smart energy infrastructure infrastructure or, or smart city. And the third group is more like an, on the innovation infrastructure to, to encourage, to encourage uh, innovation, scientific research, uh, technology development. So, so this kind of technology uh, could help to improve the, the public wealth. Uh, in general, the, the, the NDRC actually uh, per, Give us seven priority, so have seven priority areas for this uh, new infrastructure projects. They are mainly based on the 5G technology, AI technology, Internet of Things, data centers, ultra high voltage transmission grid, UHV, uh, electricity vehicle, charging stations, intercity high speed rails. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the UHV. So of these uh, seven priority areas, this ultra high uh, voltage transmission project, this UHV project, and uh, opportunity, actual opportunity for the power sectors investors and for the suppliers and also opportunities for, for our uh, green environment. So the main purpose, so this figure shows an uh, illustration of plan for China to build its uh, UHV uh, ACDC grid. So this grid is actually used to integrate the product, production side and the consumption side. So for the UHV DC light, this DC light tree is to have to move coal-fired uh, generation or renewable generation from the western part of China to the mega cities 
in order to the mega cities you can able to use the re renewable gener generated in the re remote areas and this uh, ac lines which is used to help to uh, distribute the imported electricity to the to the local communities or local and nearby uh, regions And in China, in China, we have uh, two uh, state owned power transmission utilities, the, the SGCC, the State Grid Corporation of China, and, uh, and CSG, the China, uh, the China Southern Power Grid. These two uh, grid uh, utility companies, they are, they are owners of these uh, projects. So they identified 14 projects uh, to be constructed this year, these 14 projects. Uh, estimated to be a total about uh, 26.8 billion US dollars. So this is just uh, uh, 1.2 of the total scheduled infrastructure investment in, in, in this year for the whole country. Okay, so this is still, this, this only, only account a small number of the total uh, investment. I hope this, this uh, project is able to, to uh, move this uh, renewable energy generated in the western part of China to the to the central to the eastern regions. So that's able to help to uh, help to increase the consumption of renewable energies. And the development of clean energy will become a core stimulus plan to fight the uh, COVID-19. We know that China actually is the major source countries for the clean energy technologies worldwide, particularly for solar panel, wind, wind, uh, wind uh, engines. And what the government needs to do is to ensure that uh, the, clean of, uh, the clean energy transformation is placed on the top position of the government plan. So then, then will lead to the investment will be guided to, uh, to a more sustainable development path. Actually, in, in last year, the global economic growth reached nearly uh, uh, 3%. At the same time, the energy-related carbon emissions stopped growing. So I think can, uh, China contributed quite a lot to, to this uh, uh, positive uh, environmental impact. Of course, there remains a lot of challenges for the energy firms. Uh, energy firms as the upstream industry, and they are greatly affected by the, the COVID-19, and because the uh, demand for energy reduced a lot, right? And in particular for power generation, because the uh, most of the uh, industrial industrial sector service sectors are, are idle, so the demand for electricity reduced sharply. And uh, in particular for renewable energies, right? even though you are able to regenerate renewable energy, so no one will use, no one, no one use it. So then also there's a big problem as far as the overcapacity of this uh, large scale uh, renewable energy power plants. And this is mainly due to the transmission cost, very high transmission cost, and due to the, to the problem of the, the grids and grid connecting to the grids and national grids. And of course, at the same time, this uh, traditional, uh, traditional power generation will, will still uh, emit uh, environmental pollutants. At the same time, a lot of renewable energy companies suffer from a huge loss. Actually, for example, the, the Yunnan, Yunnan province is one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, provinces in China just to uh, provide the green energy because in Yunnan, the electricity mostly are generated from uh, hydropower, so it's very clean. And uh, more than half of the uh, electricity generated in Vietnam is uh, uh, exported to other regions of China. So with the quarantine policy, with the decline of the demand, then this kind of uh, those uh, electricity generated to be ex exported will not be exported. Right? That would be a huge loss for, for the power sectors. And also, as I also mentioned, because of the transmission cost is too high, it makes it less competitive for the renewables to compete with the uh, fossil fuels. And because of less, lack of the capacity in power dispatch. So that is why the government started to plan for this so-called uh, uh, UHV project. Right? This UHV project will be able to uh, kind of to lower the transmission cost and able to 
uh, improve the power dispatch uh, capacity. So if you look at different, different uh, uh, new energy firms, so these are the list of uh, new energy firms, we can see compared to last year, this is the revenue of last year, this is the revenue of this year, you show that's a significant, significant uh, decline of the uh, revenues for those uh, new energy firms that have a, have a big, big, big problem for, for those new energy firms to survive uh, during the, this uh, pandemic. Of course, we may, the, we may, the, there's we may a lot of uh, challenges for the, the Chinese government. The Chinese government actually faces quite a lot of uh, um, pressures for the economic st uh, stagnation in the first quarter. And that's also some potential overcapacity because of the heavy investment. So we know that the, the second point or in the government work report is about the uh, four trillion plan. This, this four trillion plan actually is to mostly is used to develop the new infrastructure and uh, uh, with a priority for the U3 project. But remind us that actually uh, after at the end of 10, uh, 2009, the financial crisis, the government also uh, started the uh, four trillion plan. So that four trillion plan, the uh, stimulus plan actually has led to a serious overcapacity problem for some industries, in particular for the, for the steel the industry, for the cement, coal industry, for those uh, heavy industries. And these heavy industries, the overcapacity of these heavy industries also result in the Heavy pollution, heavy pollutions for the for the whole country. So, so will this new four trillion plan have the same uh, bad impact, bad outcomes? And also, we see that if you look at this figure, it shows that the uh, uh, China steel products inventory shows because because of this uh, the significant decline of the demand domestically and uh, internationally. So the overstocking, overstocking becomes a big problem for the steel industries, right? So it is possible, it is possible that there will be a rebound. Remember, during the financial crisis from 2008 to 2009, although there's a, a decline of the total emissions about 1.3%, then one year later, that with the economic recovery, the economic stimulus plan actually uh, made the number rebound quickly in 2010, hitting a record high. So although WMO uh, estimates that the, this year, the total emission, the global emission will decline by 6%, but this 6% is, e even this uh, 6% is not enough to achieve the Paris Agreement. So to achieve the Paris Agreement, actually we need to reduce the global emissions by more than 8% every year. So 6% is not enough. And we still have to aware about the possible rebound because of the economic recovery plans. Okay. And we also, as I showed, just showed, right, because of the, uh, the inventory uh, has reached the record high for those that steel for metal uh, industries, and if later the government uh, introducing some, for example, some uh, large scale construction project, these construction projects may increase the demand for cement and steel output, right? This will uh, result in increased uh, carbon intensity. That's the possible uh, emission rebound. So will this uh, new four trillion plan have the same result as we, so for the 2008 for trillion plan. So then we have to understand what drives this uh, problem, this overcapacity problem for the four trillion plans in the 2008, right? First is because of rebound, and second is because of the potential corruptions, and third actually is because of the, the, the so-called uh, uh, promotion mechanisms of the government officials or say so-called uh, political connection problems. So actually, uh, because of the current promotion mechanisms of the Chinese government is mainly based on the economic development on the infrastructure construction. So uh, the officials 
they are more to pursue this uh, short term, short term uh, development goals. So then this uh, in particular have a big impact for the energy industries and for the energy firms. So why? Because uh, because for energy firms, they are mainly state-owned companies or they have a, a strong political connection with the government. So because of this uh, relationship, this uh, strong political connection, there will be two impacts. So one is the so-called happen grant effect. So the government, uh, com these uh, energy companies, they are able to receive more government subsidies, subsidies because of their political affiliation. By having this large amount of funds, the cash flows, they are more likely to have access investment projects. And at the same time, that's kind of the so-called grabbing hand effect. This is because the local politician, if they want to get promoted, they need to have a, a good performance. Like them, they have a good political performance or political achievement. To get this uh, additional political achievement, they have to, they have to, they need to get the help from the energy firms. If the energy firms do more investment, then the achievement will be uh, looks more beautiful for those politicians. They have a higher chance to get promoted. So this we call is a grabbing hand effect. So both these having hand effect and grabbing hand effect result in the overinvestment for the energy firms. So these are the several reasons uh, we discovered from the literature and from my previous studies uh, why. This is a four trillion plan in 2008 actually results in the overcapacity. So therefore, we have be, the government needs to be, uh, well, be aware of this uh, potential negative impact of this four trillion plan. Okay, of course, then of course, uh, this uh, four trillion plan, this uh, new infrastructure project, this UHV project will have a, a good, a positive impact, right? So because of the construction of the UHV project, this will reinstate the confidence among the, uh, uh, the wind and solar energy firms. And we also attract investment uh, for the electricity generation sector for the associated uh, investment. And of course, because these uh, projects, UHV projects, we are able to have a positive impact because it's able to uh, deliver the uh, re renewable energies from far remote areas to the, to the places where the demand is high and to reduce the energy containment rate. And also, of course, because of the financial support from the government, we are able to uh, do more uh, new uh, infrastructure projects. And of course, this end will promote the use of the, promote the use of new energy for uh, new energy consumption, in particular, those are renewable energies. And it will be able to alleviate the energy shortage in the central and eastern regions because in the now we see the UHV, the electricity develop, developed uh, southern kilometers away can be developed delivered to to the mega cities, right? And at the same time to reduce the pollution because we are now, now able to use more renewable energies. And also because the Chinese government they have a, a very ambitious targets to to increase the, the use of renewables for in, in, the, in the next uh, decade. So luckily we, we saw this uh, good news, uh, this uh, GDP growth reported by the government two, two days ago. So although we have a, a sharp decline of this uh, GDP growth in the first quarter in China, now in the second quarter we see a, a strong return of this uh, economic growth is uh, reported to be 3.2 in the second quarter of, of China. So uh, with an un unemployment rate of about uh, 5%, quite reasonable. So overall, overall uh, opportunities and challenges are coexisted uh, for this uh, after COVID-19 uh, period or, or the the recovery period. So in economics, in general, we, we talk about two things, efficiency and equity. So when containing this uh, spread of these diseases, the government is able to uh, respond quickly. So, and they are able to treat everybody equally, right? Everybody can get a free treatment by the government. 
with this confirmed case. So the government is able to implement efficient and equitable uh, response to the COVID-19. So after, so for, it is able for the government to also do more equitable and efficient uh, plan for this uh, economic recovery. So this is more important things for the, for the government to, and also for the policymakers to, to reconsider. And uh, uh, these are a list of references uh, I used uh, for this presentation. And with all this, I would like to uh, thank you again for your listening, and uh, I'm ready to take uh, questions. Okay, I think I, I got a couple of questions. So the first question saying, why is China building so many new coal-fired power stations? Hey, not, not in this year, actually. So first of all, um, coal is still relatively cheap compared to uh, other technology, other resources. And uh, even though China is building coal-fired power, power plants, so it's uh, actually the technology of using the coal is uh, uh, significantly improved the efficiency in terms of efficiency in terms of to uh, deal with the emissions. And uh, we have the so-called uh, supercritical uh, coal-fired power plants. And this the efficiency of this supercritical power plant actually the efficiency level is, is about uh, double of those in other European and uh, uh, American countries. So, in terms of technology, it's much uh, it's much better, and also because it's, it's still relatively cheap compared to other technologies. But in the same time, uh, the government actually is invest quite a lot for for renewable energies, and the government aims to increase the use of renewable, the production uh, use of renewable for the total energy to be uh, at least twenty percent uh, in 2030. And these two uh, aims to peak the CO2 emissions in 2030. So actually, the government is to do two things together, right? In the same time, to build more efficient coal-fired power plants in order to keep the, the cost, electricity generation cost, as low as possible. And at the same time, they do a lot in, to invest in the renewable energies. OK, and second. Uh, share the PPT? Yes, of course. Uh, I think uh, uh, IAE will be able to uh, upload the PPT to the website and, and you are able to download. Thanks. And uh, what do you think about the China's new policy to promote the sales of electric vehicle after even for the rural areas of the COVID-19 uh, pandemics? Uh, as I mentioned, that's this uh, for this uh, new infrastructure, the new infrastructure project. One of the seven priorities is first is on this uh, install in, install of these uh, charging stations in the charging stations. So this will, of course, have to promote the uh, use of these uh, electric vehicles. Actually, as I know, for uh, most uh, for many many uh, city provinces, uh, city government or provi provincial government, they have they have a respective uh, policies to the, to encourage the use of uh, EVs. For example, to in Shenzhen, in Shenzhen, uh, if you buy a traditional car, you have to draw a lottery or to wait quite a long time in order to get a get a, a plate to get a permit to buy. But if you buy an electric vehicle, you can buy directly. So that's kind of the local policies. And again, that this, uh, this, with this new, new infrastructure projects, this new policy uh, announced by the central government, it will construct more uh, charging stations still be more convenient for the drivers of these EVs, right? So then definitely we'll encourage the use of the EVs in the, in the future. 
So uh, how China plans to balance increased portfolio of renewable uh, energy? Okay, in China, uh, the renew renewable energy most recent Uh, recently, mostly the use of okay is for hydro. Now the plan for the government actually is to increase the use of uh, wind and solar power. So we know that in the in the western part of China, there's a refund, uh, abundant resources from wind and solar, and also most of these uh, renewable power state uh, power plants they are constructed in the western part of China. Okay, so that is why. And previously, because of the problem to uh, for the for the uh, electricity electricity dispatch, so it's difficult for electricity generated in far away to be delivered to the place where the, the demand for electricity is high. Okay, the demand for electricity is very high in the eastern part of China, but the supply is low. In the western part of the of China, the supply is high, but the demand is low. How to make how to balance this mismatch. So that is why the, in this uh, new uh, economic recovery plan, they, the government uh, set up this uh, new infrastructure project, in particular this uh, UHV project, in order to, in order to in, improve the, the electricity dis dispatch, in order to be able to uh, deliver the electricity from the remote areas. And then, of course, then definitely, this will uh, significantly reduce the, the containment rate of the renewable energies and uh, will increase the use of the wind and solar energy in particular. Of course, at the same time, the government is also uh, constructing a nuclear, nuclear power plant, nuclear power plant uh, for, and we know this is also a, a kind of clean and is uh, relatively safe. So that's the plan uh, for China. And what do you think are the perspective for nuclear technology? Okay, as I mentioned, so uh, for nuclear, uh, there's a lot of discussions, right? Uh, in particular of the Fukushima accident. So in, in particular in the in the Western countries, right? So for for you for Europe, uh, Germany and Switzerland they uh, started to phase out nuclear. So I, I stayed in Switzerland before I moved to Hong Kong, and I also worked on a project to study how uh, this phasing out of nuclear have impact on the economy. So they would they would like to do something. And but in the same time, you know, the France is neighboring country of Switzerland, right? But France has, they are using more than seventy percent of new electricity is from nuclear. So. Of course, uh, Germany, Switzerland, they uh, reduced the uh, use of nuclear, but still, if France is doing this at the same time, it, 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 it still use uh, nu uh, nuclear at the same time, the potential, potential risk, right? So when we're talking about nuclear, we are talking about the potential uh, failure of nuclear uh, reactors. So the probability is extremely low, if it, if it happens, then it's a big loss, of course. We have to admit this. Right. Mm, so that is uh, why we have to first to think about how to improve the, the safety standard, uh, to improve the safety standard in order to be able to, to uh, further reduce the possible risk. And uh, in the same time, we have to regularly to maintain this uh, this uh, power, nuclear power plant uh, in, a, in a routine manner. And thirdly, we have to also have to think about how to deal with the nuclear waste, right? Nuclear waste. These are the, of course, these are the uh, negative part of the nuclear, but the positive part of the nuclear is that uh, it's clean and actually is quite cheap. It's, it's quite cheap compared to other uh, renewable technologies, even compared to even compared to the the coal power plants. So, for a short run, if China would like to transit in a in a fast fast way uh, to a greener economy, nuclear needs to play a role. Yeah, that's my own.
Okay, I think I answered most of the questions. So with this, I would like to uh, thank you again for your uh, participation. Then I would like to hand over to uh, Rebecca. IAEE wishes to thank Dr. Lin Zhang for an outstanding webinar. This webinar will be available on IAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member of IAEE, we encourage you to join by visiting www.iaee.org. We thank you for attending, and I now officially close this webinar.